Good morning, church. Boy, it's good to be back. I told myself I wouldn't get emotional, but you guys, if you know me, I'm just a crybaby. I missed you guys deeply. Let me just say this. Don't take things for granted. I have seen that in God's word. I've heard it of not taking things for granted, but it's different when you live it. And I want to thank you guys so, so much. In this season that my family and I have been through and are going through, words cannot describe what we have felt for my church, my church family. We love you. Love you too. Let me just open up by reading some of the verses that my family and I have clung on to, the truths of what the Holy Spirit spoke through the Apostle Peter when he said this. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 says, Through faith, you are being protected by God's power for the salvation that is ready to be revealed at the end of time. Faith. Because of this, because of your faith, because you know that you are saved, because you are a child of God and he is with you, because of this, he says, rejoice, but not only rejoice a little, he says, rejoice very much, even though now for a little while. And a lot of times it's necessary. You have been grieved by various kinds of trials. We've lived this. We're living this. The church, we have joy. Because God's working in us. And he's refining my faith. My family's faith. Verse 7, so that the proven character of your faith, there's that word again, which is more valuable than gold, which passes away even though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is, re and is revealed. Let me say this, church. Through this whole season, my family has glorified God and will continue to glorify God in the highs and definitely in the lows. Our prayer throughout this season is that we be a testimony to people that we run into at the hospital everywhere we can so they can see who we belong to, which is Christ Jesus. By the way, for those of you that are new here today or have been with us for a month or so, my name is Eddie. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Bible Church, and my family has gone through a, a season of struggle. My oldest was ill, and he's on his way back to recovery. He's about 80% there. And all of this, I know it, it's because of your prayer, because of your faithfulness. My beautiful wife, CJ, my beautiful daughter-in-law, Brisa, my son, Aaron, and my youngest son, Ethan, we have felt your prayers, church. And Aaron's recovery has been an amazement. Doctors and nurses and therapists have been saying, wow, and I'm saying, not wow, God. There is power in prayer. And it's humbling, church, it's humbling to be on this side and being ministered to. It's not enough words that I can say to thank you for your love, for your generosity, for your support. Let me also say this. If you're new here at Grace Bible Church and you're searching for a home or you're not a member at Grace Bible Church, this is the church. This is true, a true family. I've always known it, but now I really feel it. And here's what's going to happen going forward. The enemy meant something for evil, but God has turned it for good. Church, I am more in love with God than ever before. I am more in love with this church than ever before. I am so much on fire that every neighbor in every neighborhood is going to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And I want you guys to unite with me to really live out our mission statement, to lead our city into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ and his, and his church. It takes a church, invite people, trust God, and move forward in his will. I missed you guys so, so much. And I'll be little by little transitioning back into Laredo as my son gets better. 
and he is every day. Thanks be to God and his church. Thank you guys. Thank you guys again. It was about six years ago or maybe even seven, I was sitting down having a conversation with a good friend of mine. He is a Catholic. Before I continue, I'm not bashing and I will not bash Catholicism. That's not what I'm going to do. This was just a conversation. This is just factual. As a matter of fact, I have really good friends that are Catholics. Shout out to my homies out there, okay? <laughs> so we were talking and he had just finished this awesome retreat called the Axe Retreat. And he was telling me how awesome it was, how he felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. But at the end, these men were going to receive communion. And he was excited about receiving the Lord's Supper. But one of his good friends was rejected. He couldn't receive communion. And the reason behind that was because the priest said that he had been divorced. No questions asked. You are divorced, can't receive communion. So that didn't sit right with my friend. And then he started telling me this. He said, you know what? And some of the things that I'm being taught don't sit right. For example, he says, penance. I go to confession and then I got to do these things, say these prayers, do these acts in order for me to be truly forgiven. And so that gave me the opportunity to start sharing the gospel. And I was like, yes. And I started telling him, look, it's not by works. You've been saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. And when Jesus hung on the cross and said it was finished, he meant it, it was done. And so by you having to do penance, what you're saying, what you're being taught, I told him, was that Christ's work at the cross was not sufficient. That's what you're ultimately saying. And he was listening to me attentively. He was like, all eyes were on me. And I was like, come on, come on, come on, Holy Spirit, do your thing. And then he said this, he said, Eddie, I know what you're saying is true. I can feel it. It makes sense to me. I have no argument, but it's not what I've been taught. I've been taught these things growing up. So because I've been taught these things, I believe these things. I have been taught that I have to go to confession and do penance. I have been taught that I have to work in order to be saved. And so that's what I believe. And that's what I do. But isn't that true of all of us, church? Isn't that true of all of us? In that what you believe is how you behave. Think about it. What I believe, what you believe is how I behave. How you feel and what you've been taught will hinder how you react. What I believe determines how you behave. Me being raised Catholic as well, I know what he was talking about. I was taught these things as well, so that's how I behaved. I believe salvation came from works, and then I realized through God's truth that works don't work. And again, many of us believe this. Why? Because what we believe is how we behave. Today, we're going to jump back into our series on the gospel according to Mark. So we have your Bibles with you. Please open them up to chapter 7. We're starting a new chapter today. We're going to look at verses 1 through 23 of chapter 7. A lot of verses to cover. I'm going to go pretty fast, so bear with me. And here's how we're going to break down today's verses. We're going to look at three primary things in today's reading. First of all, we're going to see what the Pharisees believed and how they behaved. Their belief and their behavior. And then the second thing we're going to see is the problem with that belief and with that behavior. What was wrong with the way they taught things and how they behaved? And then lastly, we're going to see what the true problem is in our behavior. Three things we're going to cover in these verses. So let's begin. Verse 1, chapter 7 of the gospel according to Mark. It reads like this. It says, now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem. Now these Pharisees and scribes, these, these experts of the law were in Jerusalem mostly. 
And they traveled 90 miles to Capernaum, which is Jesus' home base. 90 miles, not to hear from his teachings. Remember, if you've been with us through this series, the primary objective of the Pharisees and the scribes was to trap Jesus. And up to now, Jesus has confronted these Pharisees and scribes, but he's been kind of gentle. As we're going to see in these verses, he's going to take the gloves off and he's going to go round by round with these Pharisees. So let's begin. Round one. Ding, ding. That's from the Rocky movie of you guys. Here we go. Verse two. They saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. Now Mark, remember, Mark is primarily speaking or writing to a Gentile audience, Roman Gentile audience. And this is why it is important for him to clarify what the Jews believed they had to do. And one of the things that they needed to do was to wash their hands before eating. Verse 3, for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless... They wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. That's the reason for it. And when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash their hands. And there are many other traditions, Mark says, that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees met up with Jesus because they saw that his disciples were not behaving the way they should. They were not acting out according to the teachings of these Pharisees. And they believed their disciples were defiled. They were unclean because they did not wash their hands. Now, this had nothing to do with hygiene. Not at all. Pharisees taught that a Jewish person needed to be cleansed. And if he or she was not cleansed, they were not considered holy. They were considered defiled. So by the disciples not following these religious rituals, the Pharisees saw them as unfit to be called holy or devoted to God. So what was the Pharisees' problem with his belief and behavior? Here's what that was, is that they believed that outward ceremonial rituals needed to be done to be cleansed. They needed to do something outwardly in order for them to be holy before God. They believed that defilement, uncleanliness came from the outside in. And that's why they taught that they had to wash their hands. Before eating. Again, what you believe is how you behaved. And that's what they believed. And that's how they behaved. Now in the Old Testament, God's law, it required for the high priest to properly wash their hands before they went into the holy of holies. Before they sacrificed before God. But by this time, these Pharisees, these scribes, had added law upon law upon law, 613 to be exact, that they had taken God's word, the true law, and added to it. These were considered oral laws, traditions. And these oral laws were organized in something called the Mishnah. Will you guys say that word with me out loud? Mishnah. Say it again. So when someone asks you what the Mishnah is, you'll know, okay? So the Mishnah, like I said, were these oral laws and traditions, man-made traditions that were compiled. 25% of the Mishnah was on cleansing ceremonies. 25. 50% of the Mishnah was on things you couldn't do on the Sabbath. The other 25% of these oral traditions were just crazy rituals and regulations, now stay with me. I know I have a lot of information to give you. Two of the primary cleansing ceremonies that needed to be practiced were these. One of them was the most common, the washing of the hands before eating. And so what the Jewish people were required to do based on the traditions of the elders, 
the oral tradition, was to put water on their hands, holding them up before God. Not much water, just enough to cleanse their hands. And they would go finger by finger, rubbing their fingers with the opposite hand with the knuckles, just cleaning them completely. There was another ritual ceremony, cleansing ceremony, was a little more intense, if you will, called baptizo, which means baptism, submersion. They literally had to go underwater in order to be cleansed. And depending on what you touched that was unclean, depended on how much time you had to be outside of the Israel nation or their city before you were considered clean after being submerged in water. And this is the reason Mark is reminding his Gentile audience when he says, and there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. They had to do these rituals. Could you imagine, church, every time you went to HEB or to Walmart or even outside, before you came home, you had to be cleansed completely. Imagine, no hombre que COVID ni que nada. This is much worse. But that's what they had to do. Why? Because that's what they were taught. And they believed it. And so this is the way they behaved. And because the disciples did not behave according to the belief of the Pharisees and the scribes, they questioned Jesus. Verse 5. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? Why don't they behave the way they're supposed to? Why aren't they washing their hands, but instead they eat with defiled, with unclean hands? Now notice, these Pharisees, these scribes, they don't question the disciples directly. They could have. No, they go to Jesus and say, hey, how come your, your disciples aren't doing what they're supposed to do? Again, they're trying to trap him. And see, I love what one commentary writes. He says this, the Pharisees believed that to ignore these regulations, these rules, was to sin and make you less holy. To follow these rules and regulations made you clean, made you more holy. Do you know what this is called, church? Legalism. This is legalism. The definition of legalism is this. It's strict, literal, or excessive conformity to the law or to religious or moral code. And legalism breeds a self-righteousness that promotes prideful comparisons and smug judgments. Legalism, to some extent, church, legalism restricts free choice. It restricts freedom. And this is why Jesus says, I came to tell you the truth because the truth will set you free. There is no freedom in legalism. You're just bound by rules and regulations, by traditions. And the thought behind all these rules and regulations, legalism, is that if someone keeps them well enough, they become more spiritual. Religions... All religions believe works work. All religions believe this, that works work. In order for someone to be saved, you need to work at your salvation. That's what I was taught being raised Catholic. That's what I believe. But works don't work, church. Rules and regulations, all they are are just that. They're a list of do's and don't do's. Don't dance. Don't drink. Don't wear a certain thing. Don't listen to Luis Miguel. I would never follow that rule, by the way. <laughs> These are just rules that are man-made, have nothing to do with God's truth. They just are there to regulate lives. And that's what my friend was complaining about. Why do I have to do penance after I confess my sins to God, why can my good friend who has changed cannot receive communion because he's divorced? That's what he was complaining about. All this legalism that the church had put on them. But if you think about it, all these rules, these regulations, these traditions, they're all outward. All of them are. They're all superficial. 
which is easier to refrain from? Dancing, drinking? Or is it easier to refrain from being prideful? What's really deep inside of us? Envious, jealous, selfish. Everything else is outward. What counts is what's in the inside. And legalism just does that. Superficial. Look at me. I'm acting this way. I'm holy. So let me ask you. Do you consider yourself legalistic? It's easy to become very legalistic, church. It's easy to start believing the lies of religions and denominations that tell you what you should do and couldn't do, not even based on God's word, but based on man's word. So are you legalistic? Have you become an accidental Pharisee? Answer these questions and be honest. Do you read your Bible to get a check mark rather than to meet with God? Every morning, got to read my Bible, check. Got to come to church, check. Do you justify yourself by comparing yourself to others? Like we read in the gospel according to Luke, that parable that Jesus speaks about where the Pharisees looks down at someone and comes up to God and prays, God, I'm so thankful I'm not like them. Like that prostitute, like that tax collector. Do you compare yourself to others? Do you feel the need to point out someone else's sin? Did you see what they did? Have you heard what they've been doing? Are you judgmental? Do you come to church and think to yourself, I can't believe they didn't sing a single hymn today. How could they? How come the pastor hasn't preached over a month and he comes back and he's not wearing a suit and tie? Are you kidding me? He's wearing jeans. Legalism. It creeps in and before you know it, you become an accidental Pharisee. But you guys know what the worst kind of legalism is? It's adding human regulations to the word of God. That is the worst kind of legalism. And most religions do this. Which leads us to the problem that the Pharisees had with this belief and the way they acted. And here's what it was. Is that they were holding traditions equal to God's word. That's what they were doing. And most religions do this. They hold man's tradition equal equal to God's truth, his word. Listen closely, church. If you get nothing else from today's sermon, please remember this. Adding, substituting, or making traditions equal to God's word is legalism. It's idolatry. It shouldn't be done. It nullifies God's word. It does. And it's idolatry because we elevate our human traditions over what's divine, over the truth, over God's word. And that's not what we're supposed to do. This is the authority of everything, period, nothing else. And so Jesus goes on and tells them this in verse 6. And Jesus said to them, well, did I say a prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, and he, and he quotes Isaiah, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts... Their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. Jesus rebukes these Pharisees, punches them, jabs them, and says, you guys are hypocrites. You know what the definition of a hypocrite is? Is acting or trying to be someone you're really not. And what Jesus was telling them is saying, look, the prophet Isaiah was writing about you when he said this, that you honor me with your lips. That's all you're doing. It's just lip service. Your worship is just from the outside. It's superficial, but your heart, your true worship is far from me. You guys are being hypocrites. I pray, church, that that's not us. I pray that our worship is true. It's from the heart. It's from the inside. That it's authentic. Jesus also says this in Matthew 23, verse 27, speaking to the scribes. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. And here's that word again, hypocrites. Why are you hypocrites? For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful and holy and righteous. But within, 
You're dead. You're like dead bo people's bones and uncleanness. So also, he says again, outwardly you appear righteous to others. But you're just a hypocrite. Because within you, you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Who you really are is inside. So God is saying, don't try and fool me by your outwardly actions, your traditions, your rules and regulations. Don't be a hypocrite. Traditions are not equal to God's word. They never have been, church. They never will be. This is the only authority, the only truth. Jesus is going to continue with these punches. I think he's going to do a hook and then an uppercut. Round two. Ding, ding. Verse nine. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order. You're rejecting the word of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. That's what Moses said. That's God's word. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, which means it is given to God. Verse 12, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God. How? By your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. Jesus is driving home the point saying you are rejecting God's truth to establish your own belief. And this is why he says this again in verse 10. For Moses said, Moses spoke the truth of God. Moses spoke on behalf of God. Moses was God's spokesman. But Moses said, honor your father and your mother. That's a fifth commandment. But you say, on contrast, you say, you're not speaking for God. You're speaking for yourself. You're speaking for man. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother. And let me explain what's going on here. For me to do so, I need to go back a little bit to legalism again. I love how the late great R.C. Sproul, he breaks down legalism into three categories. And this is what he says. R.C. Sproul says this. First of all, the first type of legalism, which is the worst, is, is the one that says that you have to be saved by works. Because it undermines the truth of being saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus alone, period. That is the worst kind of legalism. And, and unfortunately church there are so many churches that teach this the other sort of legalism is believing traditions over or equal to scripture adding or substituting to God's word thus abolishing it unfortunately church there are so many churches that teach this and the last sort of legalism according to R.C. Sproul is this is a legalism that observes scripture but misses the point Boy, do church do this. Churches get God's word or people, teachers, false teachers get God's word and they twist it. They manipulate it to benefit them. What they do is get God's word to contradict what really is God's word. And this is what Jesus means when he says this. Verse 12, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban that is given to God. And then he goes, you no longer permit to do anything for his father or mother. Thus making void the word of God by your traditions. Corbin was a well-known known tradition. And what it described was, was that something was set aside. And they got this tradition from, from Numbers. The book of Numbers, chapter 30. I'm not going to get into that. But they had twisted God's word to benefit them. And so they have gone this tradition, Corbin, that said that you are reserving for God your possessions, your money, your land, your people, if you had any slaves, all was for God. And what this meant, at your death, you would give all that you had set aside for God to the temple. It was kind of like a deferred giving. Not till you die would you give these things to God. So what the Jewish people because of the Pharisees' teaching we're doing, 
is that this Corbin tradition would allow you to spend your money any way you wanted on yourself. But you could not. You could not spend it on anything or anyone else. So what Jesus was saying, he was like, you're changing God's word which says to honor your father and mother. And yet because of your tradition, Corbin, what you're saying that if your father and mother are in need, you can go up to them and say, sorry, mom and dad, I can't help you financially. Corbin, that's what they were doing. They were twisting God's word, contradicting to the truth of God's word to benefit them. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, wow, I would never. How could they? Really? Church, we do that today. Let's be honest. God's word clearly says that sexual intimacy is between a man and a woman once they're married together. Man and woman. That's it. But we've twisted God's word to say, well, I love them so passionately. God's word calls for purity that says a man and a woman should not have sexual intimacy until they're married. But we've twisted and say, well, I'm going to marry them eventually, so it's okay. God's word clearly says that we are to give sacrificially with cheerful hearts to his church. But what do we do? I serve. I serve a lot. That should take care of that, shouldn't it? God's word clearly says that we are to serve others as Christ Jesus has served us. But what do we do? I give. We are guilty of this church. Every single one of us. Things haven't changed. As a matter of fact, read 2 Timothy. Things are going to get worse. Listen, no portion, no portion of scripture should ever be taken out of context. Should never be twisted to benefit us. Should never be added to or taken away. None. So let's recap quickly. So far we have seen what the Pharisees believed and how they behaved. We've seen the problem with that behavior and that belief, that teaching. Now we're going to see the real problem with our behavior. Verse 14, and Jesus called the people to him again and said to them, hear me, all of you, and understand. What Jesus is doing here is, hey, listen to me. What I'm about to say is the truth. Understand this. Don't listen to what these Pharisees and scribes have been telling you. That's just been rubbish, traditions, regulations, legalism. What I'm about to say, this is truth. And here's what he says. Verse 15, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. Nothing that goes into a person, Jesus saying, defiles him morally. What defiles him morally, what makes him unclean is what's coming out of him. It's not from the outside, it's from the inside. Verse 17, and we had entered the house and left the people. Now Jesus is in the home along with his disciples. His disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? He's saying, you too guys? You've been falling into these false teachings as well, really? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? Since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled. Thus he declared all, food, all foods clean. Here again, Mark is reassuring his audience, his gentle audience, that you, you are no longer bound to these dietary restrictions of the old covenant. It is a reminder that Jesus came not to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. And what he's emphasizing is saying, guys, listen, what you eat, whether it be clean or unclean, what you eat is going to go into your stomach and not the toilet, man. That's it. What defiles you is from the inside. What Jesus was telling them, what Jesus is telling you, 
what Jesus is telling me is that God is not concerned with our stomach. He's not concerned with our hands, how clean they are. He is concerned with our hearts. That's what defiles us. He goes on in verse 20. He says this, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. Church, the real problem with our behavior is this. It's our sinful heart. It's our sinful nature. Man's defilement, our defilement comes from within. Sin does not arise from our stomach. Sin does not arise from our hands. Sin arises from our hearts. And it comes outwardly. It's from inside out. That's the real issue. That's a real problem with our behavior. It's our sinful hearts. Jesus is going to conclude with a list of sinful behaviors. These are not all the sins. He just lists 13 of them. He says this, for from within, out of the heart of man. He's emphasizing the heart. Come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, idolatry. Adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride. He goes on and on and on. Verse 23, all these evil things come from within. And that's what makes a person unclean. Here's what I want you guys to remember. The sermon point for today. This is it. What you believe in your heart about God will be seen in your outward behavior towards God. That's the truth. What you and I believe about God, who he is, and what he does will be shown outwardly to all our community in our behavior towards God. It's all about our hearts, church. Our defilement comes from our heart. This is why Jeremiah says this in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things, and it's desperately sick. Who can understand it? Did you hear that? Our hearts are desperately, desperately sick. And nothing, nothing from the outside can cure our disease of the heart. No tradition, no rituals. No regulation, no religion, church, our works don't work. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only cure for the disease that we have of a sinful, desperately sick heart. And this is the reason that John says this in John 3, 16. You've heard this verse. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever, what's the next word? believes he says whoever believes he doesn't say whoever behaves a certain way whoever follows a religion whoever follows this tradition he doesn't say that he says whoever believes trust in him in Jesus Christ whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life that is the gospel church Believing in your heart. I'm saying this word again because it comes from the inside believing in your heart that Jesus Christ died in your place took the punishment for our sins but he didn't stay dead he rose again on the third day and conquered sin and death forever when we believe that in our hearts our deceitful sinful hearts start to change our sanctification through the holy spirit that is now dwelling in us begins to change our sick heart and with that our behavior changes because of whom we've believed. It's from the inside out. Here's how I want us to conclude this morning. I want you, where you're at, to pray this prayer that the psalmist wrote. And I really want you to mean this, church, because we want our church, Grace Bible Church, to behave always in glorifying God. So read this out loud with me. It's Psalm 51, verses 10 through 12. Where you're at, please read it out loud. Mean it. It says this, create in me. Let's pray, church. 
Father, this is our true prayer. The psalmist wrote, create in me a new heart by the Holy Spirit. Change, change us, Father, from the inside out. That this transformation be revealed to your community, to the lost. Father, and I pray that anybody's hearing your words of the gospel today, do not harden their hearts. Soften them. Give them a heart of flesh to receive the good news of your son, Jesus Christ. That if they're following some tradition, following some religion, following rules and regulation, make them understand that that does not work. Work does not work. It's trusting, it's believing in the work, the sufficient work of your son, Jesus Christ. Let that truth free them from being enslaved to these rules and regulations. Father, and I personally want to thank you for allowing me this moment to be with my church family. You know my heart and how much I love your church, Grace Bible Church. And I will continue to be a servant of you, Father, till I take my last breath and see you face to face. And hopefully we all hear these words, well done good and faithful servant. We love you. We praise you. And we say all these things in your son's name. Amen. I miss you guys so much. Don't ever forget how much I love you. God bless you guys.